Welcome to another episode of The Inevitable. This is Motor Trends Podcast on the future of the car. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? Will cars have steering wheels? What are we going to eat when we arrive? What are we going to read or watch <laughs> while we're waiting for the vehicle nice, to charge? Nice. See how we do that? Or, or while it's driving. Or while so it's driving. TV while the car is driving. Exactly. On now, this, uh, I have some recommendations. He's, he does, but surprisingly. My co-host, <laughs> as always, is uh, Johnny Lieberman. And this the, is Ed Lowe. This is, uh, it's me, Ed Lowe. As you know, head of editorial at Motor Trend, uh, our lead influencer, car guy, uh, whatever you want to call it. World's this is number one Bosch fan. This is, yes, and not Robert Bosch GmbH, as I'll no. make a terrible joke. Um, this is the Johnny Lieberman episode. The hits continue. We have a his personal, one, one of his idols. It turns uh, out. It turns yeah. out. Uh, yeah. New York Times bestselling author, author of like 30-some crime novels uh yep, yep. michael connelly some of you may know him from the series bosch bosch on also, tv also the lincoln lawyer you know what i'll do i can just read about the author here okay also he's done the lincoln lawyer which was a michael mcconaughey movie from like yeah uh, but, but it's also ago. a netflix show but here we want to just hear this here michael connelly is the author of 36 previous novels including number one new york times bestsellers the dark hours and the law of innocence his books which include the harry bosch series the lincoln lawyer series the renee ballard series and the jack mcgivoy that must be the reporter mcavoy McAvoy, mcavoy series sorry have sold more than 80 million copies worldwide. That's a lot of books. Connolly is a former New York newspaper reporter for the LA Times who has won numerous awards for his journalism, almost won a Pulitzer, and his novels. He uh, is the executive producer of three television series, Bosch, Bosch Legacy, and The Lincoln Lawyer. He's also the producer of two true crime podcasts, Murder Book and The Wonderland Murders and Secret History of Hollywood. And apparently... We might find out if Johnny can get past talking about the entire Bosch series. Is apparently he's a car guy. Yeah, that's that's how. So the, the, how this all came together was I'm friends with a producer on Bosch, Bosch named Mark Douglas, who uh, owns a Rivian. He got a, he got a Rivian around the same time I did, um, and uh, we were just talking. And he's like, yeah, you know, we, we had on the other podcast, Spike's Car Radio. I do. We had uh, Titus Welliver who plays B Harry Bosch. We had him on. And I was talking to, to Mark about getting uh, Michael on that show. And he goes, you know, he's, he's kind of a car guy. He's really into Porsches. And uh, he's EVs. really into EVs. And he's going to convert a Porsche to an EV. And I'm like, dude, we have to get him for the inevitable. That's, that's perfect. Or we have to get him because I want to talk about Bosch. Well, I could talk about. I could just start a Bosch right. podcast. A, and for the record, I haven't seen a single episode. But in You're the missing out, I, 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 apparently, I'm going to start yeah. in, in the uh, research of this. I did read up on. Uh, Mr. Connolly, and I did listen to a podcast interview he did, and he's a fascinating guy. And what I really like, and this really should be, I should figure out a way to maybe uh, highlight the uh, the L and the A in the inevitable. This ends up being another, I think, uh, conversation about how much we love Los Angeles yeah. and and every every part about it because. This guy, as Johnny mentioned, he spent uh, a number of years as the crime reporter for the LA Times during a very interesting, pivotal, pivotal year. Yeah. Ye series, sorry, years. Yeah. Uh, of Los Angeles history, not a not a great time in LA. A lot of strife, a lot yeah. of drugs, yeah. a lot yeah. of crime, a lot of murders, and apparently a lot he was of gangs. a lot of gangs. He was covering this uh, beat and and learned about LA because he's not from here. So. Yeah, and then he did something great with it. Is he turned it into a, a, a really cool character right. and a bunch of cool books? And let's, I think we should uh, get him in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do that. Let's so, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Michael. Oh wait, Michael Connell, hang on. Before that, before that, he has a new book. I don't know if you can see this, but you can't. Anyways, it's called Desert Star, and it's coming out uh, 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 November eighth, which I think should be two days after this episode drops. Okay. And um, it's in it's the next Bosch book, and now the Bosch books are really Bosch and Renee Ballard. Uh, together, so very excited about this uh, last one. You might have already pre are you on pre-order, Johnny. Is oh, right? pre-order. Uh, Renee Ballard had quit the LAPD, but I think she's getting back in. So very excited and, about that. And so you, let's be clear, you're a fan, a big enough fan that you will buy these books and read them in hardcover. Yeah, that's nuts. Well, you know, I, I, you know, he had been writing the books for twenty years before the show came out. So I watched. It was one. Of, I didn't even know they were based on books. I had no idea. I was just like, oh, I remember Titus Welliver. He was on, um, on Deadwood. Like he was a cool character. I like that actor. Looks. I like cop shows. And I was just like, well, this is a lot more than a cop show. This is a very cool show. And um, I realized there was like twenty books. And so you know, I I read one and and and. Uh, just I read them all. I just went, I had to read them all. And so then, you read the first one, Dark, 
Dark Echoes? A dark, called? dark, the Dark Hours. I think. I got it. I don't know. It, it, and they're all named like mm, some and, super fan. I don't know the names of the books. You know, the, the, the they sure. all, they, it's. They all blend a little bit. You <laughs> okay. know what I mean? Like, he, well, I'm only really asking because that's where I'm going to start after this, after yeah, this interview. I'm yeah. going to start with I this think, first honestly, one. Honestly, I think I read them out of order. The first one I read, was, the Black Echo is the first one. The Black, Black Echo. Echo. Okay. Yeah, everything's dark, black. This, um, the first one I read was Concrete Blonde, which is actually a really good one. Okay. Um, I think it's the second one. Yeah, second, third, fourth, something like that. Okay. It's in there. But, it, but, but what's cool about the show is... They, like the show is never like one book. The show is like the best parts of three different books blended together makes up a season, and it's it's interesting how they and they have such a rich, you know, thirty some novels to draw from. So it's like they never run out of ideas. But there's no way the the any of this stuff in the moving pictures is better than the written word. <laughs> um, I think it's maybe a we should ask him. Maybe we should ask him. Yeah, we'll ask him. Yeah, I, my guess is the combination of of him plus Titus makes it really magical. But anyways. Without further ado, Mr. Michael Conley. Uh, well, I'm I'm kind of fanboying out a bit here because uh, I've, I'm a self-described giant Bosch fan, and just to just to put Mr. Connolly here on the uh, Bosch, of, Robert what? Bosch, Robert Bosch GmbH from Germany. No, that different, Bosch, different Bosch, different okay. Bosch. Uh, just to, to let you know, with the level of weirdness you're dealing with, I think I've seen seasons one through four five times. Wow, season five three times. Six twice. I've only seen the Bosch Legacy, uh, which we call season seven. Only seen it once so far, but uh, I know that they're actively filming the second season of that, season eight. Yeah. So, and I've read all the books. Um, so I'm just really excited you're here. And then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm friends with um, Mark Douglas, who's a producer on the show. And he was like, you got to get Michael on. He's really into cars. And I was <laughs> like, yes, we have to make this happen. So it was welcome. Thank you for being here. And thanks for writing all the great books you write. Oh, well, thanks for having me. And yeah. I represent the other side, which is I, uh, I've heard about you <laughs> from this guy, and I just read your Wikipedia page. I listened to one of your podcast interviews on the way up, uh, and I am now fascinated because I think there's a lot of things about your past and your, your craft and everything that I'm very interested in, including the, the extent to which uh, your work, the things you've done in your past, uh, involve uh, the car. So... Oh yeah, know, the car. I, I don't know where. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know where you want to start, Johnny. But you. Well, I I would start here because I know you were a reporter, and I noticed, especially in the earlier uh, Bosch books, like there was you really had the lingo down of like the you know the, the homicide unit and, and just you know the I, I guess lingo is the best term for it. But and I was just fascinated. Like was was that your beat? Was crime reporting? Yes, I came to L.A. in 1987 to work for the L.A. Times and. Um, I left in 94, so the whole seven years I was either on police beat or um, you have a tendency to get burned out a little bit and they'll shift you around, and I was shifted to criminal court, so it's not that different, but um, it's a more of a 9-to-5 type job and not running after stories when they're happening. So um, the seven years here uh, were all crime-related and, uh, you know, talked to you know, dozens of cops a day, detectives mostly. Detectives. Right? Yeah. I I just heard uh, on this other one the podcast <laughs> seventy five to one hundred per day. Yeah, because yeah. you covered seven police stations. Yeah, yeah. LAP. Which one? Which ones? LAP. All the um, the north. Um, uh, they call it the Valley Bureau. The LAPD at that okay. time had five stations. Now it, they've made it seven. But I also covered the North uh, County. Uh, Sheriff's Department, Camarillo, um, Thousand Oaks, no all kidding. that was my territory, Malibu. Wow. Um, and then going uh, east, I had Burbank and Glendale. Somebody else had Pasadena. Oh, crazy! Wait, did you? So it, does that does so does that cover the most any of the more notorious LAPD stations? Like you didn't you didn't rampart you didn't do rampart right? No, that, that would have been uh, it, south. It was um, Foothill, where Rodney King happened. Ooh, yes, and, I know uh, exactly where that happened. And were you? Yeah. And you were here. Yeah. You were cover- wow. No, it was interesting though. I was um, that was when I they said you're getting burned out, and they put me on courts in Van Nuys. So I wasn't covering it when it happened, oh, and I, it was a, it's one of the uh, L.A. Times lasting embarrassments. They were scooped. Uh, Channel Five News broke that story. <laughs> got LA. got the videotape. Right, and uh, you know so. I always felt like if you left me on the cop beat, I probably would have gotten that, but you had to move me into the courthouse. So. But that's interesting just because, you know, no one knows this. Like the Rodney King uh, beating took place in like 
so more practically. Yeah, it was like yeah. middle or off the two ten, which yeah. no one, no one knows. I know exactly where it happened. Yeah, Osborne. Yeah, Osborne. That's right. Yeah, and um, and it, it, it's just to tie back to Bosch for a second because I noticed like you know in the last few books when he got moved to San Fernando. You know, it's like that kind of area. So it's it's interesting that, that I didn't realize you were ever working up there. Yeah, I was so. pretty familiar with that. Oh. Yeah, so I go to Foothill a lot. Um, the On the day of the verdicts, the LA Times had this uh, plan of putting reporters strategically all around the city. And I was at the spot where Rodney King had been beaten because we knew there'd be a lot of people there to demonstrate what they thought would be guilty verdicts. And then uh, uh, when it was uh, not guilty, things went sideways. Right, yeah. right. So, I mean, let's talk about that for a second. Like, what what was that like as a reporter covering the L.A. riots? That had to be... Well, I mean, they were mostly on the south end. I was, on, I was positioned on the very far north, at least on the first day. And then, then they moved everybody t- south. But... Um, it was very, you know, pretty surreal because there was a large gathering of people. There was nothing. It was basically like a gravel parking lot. Mm-hmm. Now there's a, a apartment building there. Right. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, so there's lots of people there. And um, again, I thought they were gonna, everyone was going to celebrate. You know, we were, everyone in media was kind of caught flat-footed by the, yeah, the, the verdict. <laughs> and it was interesting. There were some TV trucks there. And they had their doors open, and they're showing. They have like all these screens of what's being shown on their channel, and people started seeing um, what was happening on the south end, uh, and people setting fires and stuff. And then suddenly, this peaceful group kind of got um, angry. And, right. And uh, um, I remember I got surrounded, and and some people pulled me away. Uh, you know, people I'll never know, but they probably saved me from getting a beat down. And then they all just marched down um, Foothill to Foothill Station. And the police stations, they kind of look like bunkers, but their fronts are glass. And so they quickly uh, got a school bus and pulled a school bus up in front of the police station wow. so um, no one could get in. Oh, crazy. Um, they since redesigned uh, yeah. the stations uh, <laughs> to account for civil unrest. Um but it was, it was, you know, one of those nights of my kind of reporting career that I always remember. Right. So, That's wild. That's... I want to go talk about everything you did in your time at the L.A. Times. But before you came to L.A. Times, you worked in Flo- at a Florida paper. Yeah. And you actually were, a, you were on a Pulitzer Prize finalist team for coverage of uh, an air crash. Yeah. The, shoot. American flight? No, it was a Delta, Delta flight that was um, left Fort Lauderdale where I worked and where mm-hmm. I grew up, actually. And it was stopping in Dallas and then going on here to L.A. And so a lot of the people on there were uh, from L.A. Okay. And um, so me and two other reporters um, spent a year um, writing about, like, what the actual, what caused the crash and everything that went through that. And then also, it was an odd uh, thing because there were survivors. Twenty nine people survived. So microburst, like a weather event, right? Yeah, it was the 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 crash that made them put um, uh, the microburst equipment on every plane. Okay, was that the one that into it. went down in in the in the, um, the 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 swamps? Was that the one? No, it crashed in Dallas. Oh, it was in Dallas. Okay, yeah, okay, and okay. Um, and so we spent a year and then wrote this long long thing that um got a lot of attention and we almost won a poet's prize basically a finalist means you came in second yeah <laughs> and, um, but it caught the attention of the la times so that's how i ended up at the la times and right. when you were there so when you were in fort lauderdale were you um were you doing uh, crime reporting as well yeah okay yeah like i wanted to when i was in college i was when i decided i wanted to try to write crime novels and I kind of huddled with my parents, and they had my dad had the idea of um, going to uh, go go back to sc- go to college, get a journalism degree, and then you get close to the kind of people you want to write about. Yeah, and and again, I mean, just being a, like that's what really struck me because you know I saw the show first, and then I went back and read the books, and and yeah, you know, it, it, the books of you know I'm sure you would are the agree. books be- are the books better than the show? Um, it's it, no, I mean, I'm <sighs> sorry. <laughs> I don't know. You, look, you look, I think they're better. Yeah, I'm just sure. saying. I'll let you off the hook. Just I, go ahead and say it. I was, I just, what I would, I just think that I wanted. To, this is a question I want to ask. Like, 
like when you all right, let's just jump to here. Like when you met Titus Welliver, like I, I mean, wh- he, no one else could play this role, right? Right? I mean, yeah, no, I agree. I think he he's Harry, he's the keeper of Harry Bosch now. It's not right me for sure. It, it's um, it's incredible though. Like it just it just. Uh, Everything about and, you know, I, I've interviewed him uh, on another podcast, and just everything like like well, he's like, yeah, you know, the reason I wear the Rolex I wear on the show is because Bosch's character was an operator, and I had a lot of buddies who were operators, and they would always have a watch like that. They got in Southeast Asia, and I'm just like, yes, you know, like it's he brings a lot of his own um, interest and so forth to the character because it's it's more uh, it's a younger character than the guy in the books. Yes. Um, we're taking books that I've written 20, 30 plus years, <laughs> years ago and, yeah. and putting them into contemporary LA. So there's a lot of changes and a lot of updating we have to do. Um, and if I can amend my, my answer for a second, I think the books got better as, as they progressed. I mean, I, I, you know, the, the, the last one, the Ballard Bosch book, uh, was great, you know, like, so. Well, thanks. I mean, this, yeah. <laughs> this this will be the best podcast you've ever done, right? Because you get better at w- what you're doing yes. the more you yeah. do it. Absolutely. So, so yeah. you know. God, con- I, God I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, con- yeah, yeah. The confidence, you know, your confidence gets better. So, you know, I would agree that um, I haven't written a perfect book yet. I'm working on that. But, yeah, right. But I think the books are, are, what's the right way of saying it, without sounding like a jerk, uh, more accomplished, I guess, yeah. as, as I go. Yeah, you know, the writing, the writing, it, it gets it's you know more efficient yet you retain the spark that makes it what it is you know um and it's yeah i mean i remember that last one i put it down i was like that damn i can't i can't wait to watch this is what i was thinking like that's a that's a so, good book but before we yeah something you said which was which i heard about again just in my research I, and i read it too a very clever from your when you just said it from your father to say you want to write so you knew at like what 18 19 you want to do these you want to write crime novels and, but to go to school as a journalist and then become a reporter, get to know these people for the background, that's like, that's like some next level, like planning. But the funniest thing is, have you read your own Wikipedia page? Um, <laughs> I probably glanced at it, but not in a There's long a time. line in it that said, Connolly had planned on following his father's early choice of career in building construction and started at the University of Florida in Gainesville at the Rinker School of Building Construction, comma, but, oh, studying construction management. After earning grades that were lower than expected, <laughs> come Connolly went to the Robert to see Robert Alden Palmer, but whatever. That, I thought that line was hilarious. Like, what, what, were, what grades were you expect? What grades were you well, expecting? I like to call it a sabbatical, but I was kicked out. Ah, so, I see. So yeah. it was under a. It was like a point oh nine or something. You wow. Know? And uh, and it was because they throw you into this like you know I actually literally took a co- course called Concrete One Hundred One, <laughs> and and you know that there's seven different recipes for concrete depending on what kind of stress you're gonna put all that stuff all the physics of it and it was like I I just started bringing mystery novels with me and reading them in class right you right, know I, right. it wasn't gonna work out it wasn't you know I had grown up in high school and so forth working on job sites where my dad was. Mm. And you know it's an outdoor thing, and you're 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 using your hands and your craft, and then you get stuck in a classroom for studying for rock. twelve yeah. weeks about concrete. <laughs> you know, it's like so it didn't work out. Um, and and at that same time, I really was um, doing a deep dive into uh, crime fiction, and, uh, and that's when the spark hit. And, Always fiction. Um, well, I had this experience when I was a kid, uh, younger, uh, like 16, where I was a witness in, in a crime investigation, and I spent a night in a police station with a detective, and that really had a, it was like so out of my world. I grew up in you know middle class, um, pretty much crime free neighborhood, and uh, it was like uh, just a decisive night in my career. And then I started reading the crime stories in newspapers and then true crime. And then eventually mm. I, I started reading fiction. And you never wanted to be a detective. No, I mean, cause, and it's still pretty much this way. You don't sign up to be a detective. You end up yeah. in a uniform and it could be years. And sure. I don't have that. That's not me. Right. In right. a uniform giving tickets or telling people what to do or, or wading into fights and, Right, right, right. I couldn't do that. That's not my character. So I would have loved to have been a detective, but there was no real way to get there. Right. There's um, no quick way in. Yeah. yeah. What was this? Um, 
was the incident when you were younger. I, I, I think I read it. You had witnessed someone put a gun or throw something into the bushes, and you went back yeah. looking, and you found a gun. Yeah. Okay, and that's what you were interviewed about in the. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, they didn't use that phrase back then because this was like seventy two or something. I can't remember seventy three. Um, uh, car. It was a carjacking gone bad. Oh. Although they didn't have that phrase back then. Right, right. Um, and I didn't see any of that. I was just, I was sitting at a traffic light in a Volkswagen Beetle, since this is supposedly to be about cars. Yeah, we'll right. eventually, that. we'll get there. And, um, <laughs> and I saw this guy running and I saw him stick something into a hedge. And I was just, it was late at night. I was coming home from a job as a dishwasher at a resort. And um, so no, no other cars around. As soon as the light turned green, I made a U turn and went over and pulled it out it was a shirt wrapped around a gun oh wow and then uh again this is so long ago there was a phone booth <laughs> so i ran to a phone booth and called woke up my dad i called him said this is what i did and all that and as i'm talking to him like cop cars come racing all through the neighborhood with their lights on so i knew something had happened so he told me to flag somebody down i did and led him to the gun wow and uh the the guy had run uh, down the street and gone into this bar. Um, it was a biker bar, you know, lots of motorcycles out front. He had he looked like you, long beard and all that stuff. And uh, so they went in there and cleared everybody out. Um, you know, back then, I don't know, so I don't know what the civil rights six, but anyway, <laughs> everyone in that bar was put on a bus and taken to the police station. So I spent the night <laughs> looking at them in oh, line. In you did the purple. You did the whole thing. You did the yeah. lineup. Yeah. Wow. You were how old? 16. 16. In, this is in Florida? Yeah, in Fort wow. Florida. Wow. And, um, and then they, the detective told me, you know, they, he, this, a guy tried to steal a car at gunpoint. The guy wouldn't give up his car, and he shot him. Wow. And, um, and then ran. And, uh, and, and you know, the, that bar had a back door because they never had – they didn't have the guy, but it became a big thing of contention with the detective thinking I'm this uh, – you know, a kid that's afraid to point the finger. And I, I wasn't. I mean, I was probably stupid, but I would have. <laughs> if they had the guy, I would have ID'd him. Cause well, they I, didn't have the guy. They didn't have, uh, you know, one by, I mean, not one by one, but several lineups of, of these guys with uh, biker guys with Hell's beards Angels, and right? stuff. Wow. That's wild. Well, let me let me ask you this. So you, you're from Florida, um, but what I've always admired a lot about the books and the show, Bosch, uh, is that you really use L.A. as a character. Um, and especially, uh, I talked about this with, with other people, such as the show, but like food. I always love like, you know, that you really get the food and like where people in, from L.A. tend to eat. So when you got here, uh, you know, th- th- was it 30 years ago? Um, what would you make of L.A.? And then how did you decide, uh, or th- longer than 30 years ago, but how did you decide that like, you know, this would be where, I think all your books are focused in L.A. I mean, I know Ballard and... Well, and one of them called The Poet starts in Colorado, and maybe that's where you thought I was from Colorado. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's um, the, 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 the one I, I haven't read. The yeah, Reporter. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but Ballard... But, but and, it ends and, up in L.A. Everything is really L.A.-centric. Yeah, yeah. So you talk about, like, your first impressions of L.A. and how... I mean, I'm assuming well, you like the place. Yeah, I mean, I... I wanted to, I mean, that's the story I wrote about the um, plane crash got me a lot of interviews around the country. Like, I, so I went to Chicago. I went to the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I went to the uh, Orange County Register, uh-huh. um, and then I went to the LA Times. But I was hoping the LA Times would hire me, and they did. And it's because my knowledge of L.A., I never stepped foot into L.A. till I came for an interview with the LA Times. I was 30 years old. Oh, incredible. And it was all knowledge based on um, movies and books, Raymond Chandler, uh, Chinatown, all that. And so so I had a um, kind of like a magical view of what L.A. could be. And, uh, Did you read James Elroy? Did you read Black yeah, Dahlia? Yeah, read all those. Um, I just was, for some, Ross McDonald, Joseph Wambaugh, all these were people I read before I got here. And uh, to me, it, it it matched what I had imagined it would be or what I had seen and, and read. And so it was, it was pretty exciting, exciting time. And uh, I mean, it was, it was interesting to me. I remember when I first, you know, the first – uh, t- time I really heard. I mean, I, you know, I saw the Lincoln Lawyer movie back in the day. It was just a movie, but when the Boss show, the first season was, you know, centered in Echo Park, you know, mm-hmm. and I thought, I'm like, that's like really insider because I lived in Echo Park for years. 
And I'm like, that's, you got to be like an LA, you know, you'd never put a story in Echo Park. You know what I mean? Like, unless it's like a gang drama or something like that. Um, For those so, listening, Echo Park is where you go to get a fake ID. Amongst many, well, amongst, heroin amongst back in the many day. Other yeah, <laughs> most mostly heroin when I lived there. But uh, yeah, it, you know what I mean. But it was uh, it was I was like this is this is like you know some really insider stuff, and it's it's just not a you know it's not a you know all the people producing the show live in Brentwood or whatever you know it's not. So I was I was just like wow this is really cool. So, well, when we started the show, we were kind of aware of what LA shows usually show. And we had this goal of never going west of La Brea. Oh, nice. Um, we did We did a few times. <laughs> sure. But, but generally, and that was also one of the borders of the uh, LAPD Hollywood division. So, right. So it was like, Bosch is going to be in Hollywood and, and so on. And um, so, yeah, we've always gone east or explored east. And, oh, fascinating. Uh, and we you know this is was very careful design i don't know if you want me to go into it but please i'd love but, it yeah <laughs> but the show opens with bosch and edgar on a um, surveillance and there's a, a street i can't remember the name of it offhand but it's on the ridge up on the ridge of echo park and you, if you look to your left you can see dodger stadium right and so we wanted that in the background and um you know we wanted them just sitting there listening to a game and uh uh, when the guy they're watching makes a move. And then the next part was uh, we want this show to start with a blank screen, black screen, and we wanted to hear the voice of Vin, Vin Scully because that's the voice of L.A. Right. And so so we're, you're, you're asking me about the place as a character in the book yeah. and the show. That, we were very aware of that. Okay. And, and what was interesting is so we went to the MLB and said, can we get about a minute of, Vin Scully calling a Dodger game, and they said no. <laughs> and um, I had interviewed Vin Scully once, and like a good reporter, I kept his home number. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and nice. And so I kind of yeah. called him out of the blue, um, and he said he had tracked me and, and knew I was writing these books. And I said, Can, I want to try to fake, you, you know, when, when there, ever is, there's a delay, you give all these wonderful trivia things. Right. And, um so we'd like to have the game have a rain delay, and you're just filling the the radio space um, for about a minute. And I'll write the script, and I'll come to your house, and we'll record it. And oh, he goes, no kidding. And he goes, like, yeah, I'd be glad to do it, but I'm going to write it. And so he did write. Nice. And it was all this trivia about how there would only been five um, – uh, uh, not rain delays, but rain outs in the history of Dodger Stadium. And, and it was just this wonderful <laughs> thing. And then we put it against some crowd noise and right. so forth. And and so that's how it opens. And it opens oh, yeah, that's Vin brilliant. Scully's um, voice, which is Did so the MLB try to come after you? Like, hey, where'd you get that? And say, huh? No, because then they'd have to go after uh, Vin because he did it. You know? Right, and, right. And so it's funny. I um, You know, I'm a book writer. What do I know about TV? And this, sure. is, this is the first episode, the pilot. And uh, so he, there was some kind of fundraiser at the stadium. It was off season when when I did this. And he goes, "I'll be there, and uh, we'll find a space and we'll record it." And so I actually recorded on an iPhone, and it's the first <laughs> words you hear yeah. on on, on the show. So I really felt like I had to earn my stripes as a producer, right? Even though I had zero experience. That's amazing. I mean, but it, it's it's little stuff like that because you know, again, as an LA native, it's very obvious. Like somebody really likes this town that's making this show. You okay, know? Mm-hmm. let's let's plug the. Pi- where can I watch the pilot? Is that on Amazon? It's all yeah. on Amazon. Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's also on Freevee, their their uh, free fast app. Channel. Thing. Okay, yeah. so in continuation of because I, I also appreciate that this is a guy who didn't grow up in LA but has a lot of LA in your veins and in the work you create. But I assume you got all this LA insider information f- from all of the interviewing and all the conversations you have with like seventy five to one hundred, uh, you know, <laughs> detectives. detectives every day. Well, is they, that, they is know that, where to eat. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in some of them, they're like, is anything going on? No. Okay, talk to you tomorrow. So they're not like these deep conversations. Right. <laughs> but over time, you create, I or I, and, you know, end up with some sources that would be very significant in terms of telling me what's going on or what they've heard and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's a crowded market, the crime fiction market. And, you know, and I grew up loving private eye stories. So mm-hmm. I always thought I'm gearing myself towards writing a private eye story. Um, but then, I, you know, I'm, 
I'm reasonably smart, and I realize I have an entree into this world of a one of the most famous police departments um, for notorious as well. As, I was, was going to say most famous in this yeah. country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and like that's what I got to use. So I, right. I, you know, got rid of the idea of writing a private eye story and said I'll write a LAPD detective. But I I wanted to give him. All the stuff you see in the private eye, stuff. you know, and, a guy and, who and, feels like, like he's an outsider. Yeah, and he is. He's yeah, it's wonderfully done. He is an outsider, and he's you know, I mean, uh, spoiler alert, he becomes a private eye uh, several Eventually times. Eventually, I yeah. got there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, did you pick up this this uh, habit, skill, uh, reporting style from when you from in from Florida? Like, were you were you going into like is that how you do? I mean, what do I know about like the crime beat? Do you you just go and visit and and then you you brought this? Or is that unique to your experience as a reporter? No, I mean it's it's pretty much what you do. I mean, Fort Lauderdale was a real small market compared to L.A. and that sure. was the kind of place where I could just like walk in. You know, you, you can't just walk into any LAPD facility. Um, you know, and especially as a member of the media, they're very media savvy and centric. And uh, despite all the stupid things they end up <laughs> doing and videoing and all that, <laughs> right, uh, right. but they, you know, they view the media as the enemy, basically. Right. So it's very hard to make in- inroads and cr- and get sources going. So you you do the seventy five calls. It's almost like being a salesman. Like if you call a hundred people to try to sell something, two will buy it. You know, right. so you got to keep those numbers up. So eventually you'll find someone, uh, uh, you know, who who will tell you and has a greater picture that, you know, the the public has a right to know what's going on and not, uh, which which is a very, very minor number of people in the in that bureaucracy so can you well, can you paint that picture are you so 87 are you at uh, you're at the what's la times is now in el segundo but so you were in the in the building in downtown are you like at a desk not, you got a phone are you are you like call you got the you got your pad and you're like going through or is this like you pay personal you go you don't drive to each one and, and walk in and well well one thing you learn about la is so spread out and when i was in fort lauderdale yeah i went to the police station every day they had one big police station not not all these satellite bureaus and everything and uh so in la um i had all that territory i mentioned before but the most important thing were the was the lapd and then in van nuys they have a the called the valley bureau which is the command of the valley and you know, I wouldn't go to every one of those places every day. I usually went to one, so so I'd hit them all in a week. But it's mostly phone work, and you know, I had a desk. It wasn't downtown; it was in the valley. They used oh, to have right. a massive complex uh, all the way up in Chatsworth. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. And I, so I worked there. I had a you know a cubbyhole desk with. Um, I always had a police scanner going. And you got to remember, '87 there weren't there were no cell phones. The uh, internet really. Thomas had, Guide, you were using Thomas that. Guide. Yes. Kids um, at home, Google Thomas guy yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny. When we started the show, um, they still make those. You just don't – got to order them online. And, you know, so I ordered a box of those and gave them, like, to Titus and everybody um, yeah, to study. But anyway, yeah. the um, – yeah, I mean, it, it would be by phone. You'd hear about a crime or, like, an investigation going on. You'd go to an editor – and they would make choices on whether to send you out because it's such a vast place and it might take me an hour just to get to something. So there was a, there was a big decision-making process on whether I would leave the office if the, if the, huh. if the story or whatever was happening was big enough. What so, were you driving? Back then I had a um, – LA Times doesn't give you a car, right? It's a personal car you're logging. Well, that office had four um, uh, LA Times cars. I never wanted to use them, but often you'd go with a photographer, and the photographers always had scanners in their cars and stuff like that. Um, my personal car back then was a Jeep. Okay. What is it – what do you think it is about Los Angeles, uh, the LAPD specifically, that they have – you know, and I, I know a lot of the history of it, but, like, like there is this level of notoriety of the, of the LA Police Department, and, I, you know – um, Chief Parker and you know Gates and Rodney King and all that stuff. But what 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 is it about this place where the cops become so famous? Well, I think it's you know it's three things: the media capital is here, the entertainment capital is here. So, you know, there's been so many shows going you know all the way to Dragnet and so forth, and um, and so that's pushed LAPD out there into the world, and that's not lost on the people. 
you know, like we use a lot of real cops in, on Bosch, and, and um, I've had very high-ranking people say your, your shows help with the esprit de corps. Um, you know, people people in the department, even though you know it's a it's not all uh, roses that you portray LAPD. You, you show a lot of the corruption and so forth, but they are willing to take the good with the bad because there's this guy, Harry Bosch, who's, you know, trying to do the right thing no matter what the circumstances. And so they connect with it. Um, and I think, you know, that has happened over the decades with other shows and so forth. So there's that. We're right in the middle of the entertainment uh, capital of the world in a way. And um, and then there's also the innovation. They they are an innovative department. Right, you know, they, yeah, they invented, mobile policing. Yeah, they invented SWAT. They have the biggest uh, uh, police air force in the world, you know, 16 it's helicopters. Sec- it's also yeah. the second largest police agency after NYPD, I believe. Yeah. But it has the largest... Um, geography by far, oh, by far. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. the the i think the cop to to whatever human population citizen is the ratio is like way off of like what it is in new york in terms of because because even though the density is new york's very dense they have way more people in a much smaller like area yeah i mean that's that's really the source of the problems with lapd is long ago and um, gates was a big believer in this he was the police chief um, when i was the uh, oh, reporter um, to save money and to be in the good graces with city council and the budgeters and all that stuff, he said he could police this city with uh, 10,000 cops. You know, New York has <laughs> between twenty five and 35,000 right. cops. Right. And, uh, and that created a police force that really um, stayed in cars, never really intermingled right. with the people they're protecting and just chased the radio, just went from – call to call to call and so that went meant you went to bad situation to bad situation to bad situation bad guy to bad guy to bad guy and soon everyone's a bad guy and it created this us versus them right and, that, you know, that's fascinating and you know and that's why they end up you know beating the hell out of rodney king you know he wasn't a person to them it was very that's the way you just said it is very well depicted in um oh man was it what was the cop movie with sean penn what is early days colors colors yeah, yeah, where, yeah. They, where you see them and it's the cops in the cars rolling up and they like roll the window down and stare and it's always usually like a black guy the gangster on the other but end. that right, comes so. from i mean parker chief parker is the guy that you know mobilized the police right. force and then you know i i learned this recently Bernard uh daryl uh, gates was his chauffeur so they knew each other like very well. <laughs> he was, I, I did. I, when I read that, I like, you know, I was like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> you know. So um, Parker, wait, wait, real quick, real quick, real quick, did you did you ever interact with Gates? Yeah, a few times. Yeah. What was that like? Um, it was all very well um, managed and so forth. I don't think I ever. So there was, he had a PR person that kind of yeah, or like a phalanx of people, right. you know. Um, trying to think if I ever had a one-on-one I mean what would your general uh, you know I, I know what he looked like on the media you know like around the TV at least I should say like was, did, was he any different or was he just presented that kind of bold no, I, with me it was it was what you saw on right the, you know uh, really sharp dressed all that kind of stuff yeah imposing guy though right yeah. I mean he was tall and <laughs> yeah so um I could talk about this stuff all day, and, um, I, and yeah. I and I plan to. So yeah. let's keep going. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's what you said is super interesting. Yeah, LA had all the beautiful people uh, and all the powerful people in media. So yeah, Dragnet um, that you would call Dragnet, which was which is great, which brings to, to mind my, one of my favorite movies that depicts the this this whole thing we talked about, which is LA Confidential. Oh yeah, and uh, I always remember the Danny DeVito character in their Hush Hush magazine, right? Where he's right. he's always trying to get the score from the cops like give him a give him a hot tip on something that's happening give him a hundred bucks right <laughs> is um i mean is any of that accurate like that's a that's a that's a terrible like way to say it but is there is there any truth to that in terms of like getting hot tips people with agendas like slipping something he was also creating movie? crime in the movie to cover sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean he was more of a a gossip type guy, and I think that's all based on uh, pretty accurate on that time. It wasn't my time, but it's the 50s, right? but there's you. You always had to, you know, if someone's going to give you something, you, there's got to be an agenda. Like you know, if they're going to give you the 
uh, something that will lead to a scandal for somebody is because they want that person out of the way so they can move up or whatever. You know, so, <laughs> right, so you always right, got to right. be aware of that. Doesn't right. mean it's not newsworthy, you know, but you, you just are always aware of agendas. That's why you really um, you want to build your own sources, and um, and it's just in a place like the LAPD, it takes a lot of time. Hmm. You know, um, I mean, what you were talking about is, is kind of the crux of uh, LA Confidential, where you know they uh, Kevin Spacey's character they they take away his, him being able to be an advisor on the TV show, mm-hmm. right. and that's how they get him to play ball. You know, that's and so big, it's, that's the big punishment. Yeah. So, so in addition to um, the Rodney King beating and then the LA riots that happened afterwards, your, your time period from eighty seven to ninety four, what were other big notable um, occurrences, happenings, crime situations did you cover? Um, well, it was the, um, that was the highest homicide rates the city's ever had. Right. It was the, cause it was the crack epidemic. Right. Uh, really started in 84 before I got here, but it w- washed in. So the, the highest, uh, numbers of homicides in the city all occurred in the like 88 to 92, um, period. So it was a lot of, you know, there was murders every day, you know, it was just, uh, you know, I can't think of anything that was... You didn't, North you Hollywood know, happened after you left, right? Yeah, that happened after I left. And uh, O.J. was... O.J. Right after? happened a month after I left. Right. Oh, boy. Right, right. So uh, I had, um, my O.J. story <laughs> is that I was leaving, so I trained a guy um, uh, to take my place, and... Um, and then I was like a month into like, hey, I'm a full time novelist. This is what I wanted to do since I was 19, and right. like, like kind of living in that world. I had a, a house uh, that had a view of the city, and um, you know, and I'm in there writing my book, and my wife comes in and says, you know, you gotta watch this thing on TV. Yeah. And like I was watching it on TV, and then I could look up and see the helicopter slowly, <laughs> you know, OJ's run. But when he when he finally gave himself up, there was like this tremendous knot of uh, uh, reporters yeah. at the gates uh, to his house, and I saw the guy um, who took my place. So okay. I was thinking like I could be here as a full time novelist. Or I could be there, and man, I'm glad I'm not. I'm not there. I'm blanking on the guy's name. You probably know him, but he was a reporter at the LA Times, and now he's, he's a law professor. My wife's a lawyer, um, and anyways, he he did a, an auction for charity. One of the things he auctioned off was that photo, the Pulitzer Prize winning photo um, of of the Bronco chase, uh-huh. and I have it on my wall. And he tells a story on the back of it, and it was I, the the reporter. It was like his. Is that Miles Corwin? I think it was. It was like his first week in L.A. He's from like Nebraska, and he had a Thomas guide, and that's why. And he couldn't. He didn't know where anything was, and he just followed a, a news van, and then he like hopped on top of the van to get the still photo, and got screamed at by the you uh-huh. know the the video guys. But he got the shot, and it was. But it was the whole story is is written on the back of the photo, and it talks about oh, how he, you cool. know, yeah, it's really. But um, I can't blank on the guy's name. He was one of my wife's professors, and he worked at the LA Times. Is this at uh, UC Irvine? Yeah, yeah, that's Miles. Miles Corwin. No, 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 no. Um, no, for, no, no, no it, w- it wasn't Miles. It, it's a Jewish name. Um, oh, he was. Uh, but it was Miles who auctioned it off. He didn't take the photo. Yeah, because Miles is was it was a police reporter in my era when I was there. And no, it's, now he's a teacher at it, UC Irvine. He's at he is at UC Irvine, but it's a, it's a, his name's like Levy or something, Chuck uh-huh. Levy or. Uh, uh-huh. Anyways, he worked at the LA Times for. Anyway, I knew him because because him and Daniel like sued the LA Times at some point. So, but anyways, another great story. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, talk about the LA Times a lot. Um, let me ask you a question, and and, and one of the big differences between between the books. And the show was uh, was uh, Chief Irving, and uh, what did what did you think? You know, because in, in the books he's a real villain, right? Uh, kind of the villain of of of, uh, of one of them at least, um, and really uh, Bosch is like almost nemesis, you know. And then in the show they have this wonderful relation. I mean, also like you know, the greatest casting, <laughs> you know. Like how did how did you know how did the, that that difference? What's and what, is, what did you make the, of it? And, the key is in your own question, uh, where you you compliment the casting. So, um, the showrunner is named um, Eric Overmeyer, yeah. and he works on a show called The Wire. So yeah. he, he knew many of the actors, and and we've used many of the actors. Yes, you have. And um, so there is that, and any show always starts out with you're saying, let's get the best person for this for the 
the role. Right. You know, it doesn't matter uh, what color they are or anything like that. You know, male or female, just get the the best actor we can get. Uh, so we we start with that, but we also analyze um, Irving, the Irving from the books, and he's and Irving's only in the maybe the first uh, seven or eight of my books, right? And I forget whether we were on on the mics when we were talking about this, but I've gotten better at what I do over yeah. time. Yeah, and Irving was pretty cartoonish in the books at the beginning. Yeah, and also, and, and just for people listening, he was he was a white bald guy, not a black bald guy. Yeah, you know, which is. And he was just um, an obvious foil to Bosch, an obvious um, a guy uh, that was in Bosch's way, in Bosch doing the right thing or you know cracking the case. And uh, so we we didn't really want we wanted to make sure we didn't have a guy who was cartoonish and being a, right a bad stupid guy. chief. Yeah, 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 and we wanted more like subtle Machiavellian um, type of guy. Yeah, and so Eric said. Um, Lance Reddick would be perfect for this, except he played um, a deputy chief on The Wire, and so right. we're going to have to convince him that this will be different, and over time it will be it will be different. And uh, I can still remember we were uh, scout. I was in a van scouting um, locations for the the first episode, so I was in uh, Boyle Heights. Yeah. When Eric got a call from Lance Reddick and uh, just gave me the phone, and said convince him to take take the role <laughs> and so like i was like spinning it's it's not like the guy in the books the guy in the book is is not subtle you're going to be a subtle right uh machiavellian guy who's playing a long game that sometimes bosch will realize what's going on and sometimes he won't right um you know he wasn't a chief at the beginning right he you'll become the chief um you'll even think about running for mayor so we i was just kind of spinning stuff uh, almost off the top of my head, although we did have plans to have this character, um, you know, become a, a bigger, have a bigger sway over the department and therefore Bosch. Because he he's, agreed. he kind of, you know, it's funny, he kind of has like the most growth uh, in the show, you know, like mm-hmm. Bosch is, you know, starts as a detective and then, you know, in season six quits as a detective. Um, but like Irving, yeah, he's a mayoral candidate and he, you know, it's it, it's a fast, you know, it's, it's, it's also... Like just when him and you know, Lance and Titus are going head to head, like the you know the magic that's captured on camera, like especially especially you know well season two obviously, but season six was just like I don't know I I I, I was just it had to I don't know, it, it, and like I said it was it was the most different in my mind from the books where yeah it was yeah. not like cartoonish but you know kind of just a bad guy. Well, also Jerry Edgar's really different too, and, <coughs> and he's hardly right. in the books. He's at all. not in the yeah yeah yeah. And and he when he's in he's like I kind of built again he's another one who's who's uh, I didn't do a deep dive on character I was so c- much concentrating on Bosch these other characters are kind of cardboard thin right in the books in the early books yep and, yep yep um, you know and he, and he's another he, guy from the Wire right I mean, yeah 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 so is it normal for the author of the source material to be that involved in the pilot production? I, where, I don't, you're, where you're convincing principal actors to join? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, I, I don't really know. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> but but remember, the the it was Amazon. Amazon sells a lot of my books, and so they kind of uh, set that table. And, right. and also, I'd been writing these books for at least 20 years before Amazon came along, and I wasn't just going to – I've done deals where I just give them the book and say good luck and I hope it's good. And I wasn't going to do that with the character I've invested 20, uh, 20 years in. So I said to them, uh, if you want to do this, I'm coming with you and I'm going to get certain things in a contract. You know, like... Uh, nice. Uh, I what are, act- you listed, are you listed as executive producer? Or? Yeah. Nice. And like I, in my contract, it was like every shot had to be filmed in L.A. because the show, L.A. is a character, you know, and they could have, you know... I like, I created a show. Go to Toronto or Sydney yeah, no, or something. I, I created a show back in the '90s called Level Nine. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah, sure. And it, it was, the lead was an LAPD detective, and they shot it in Vancouver. And there's there's <laughs> the a truck with things. all these palm trees and pots, <laughs> and they wherever the location is, right. they, this truck would come in and they put up palm trees. It was just it got canceled after six episodes, and you I know, know I, I kind of know why. Right. And and so I learned from that. So I said, you know, Bosch and L.A. are are, are you know. 
synonymous. Yeah, yeah, and so you got to film it here, and, and they agreed. What well, um, was one of those experiences? Uh, does that include Lincoln Lawyer, the original, or the Netflix? The, the no, the movie though. The movie, the movie yeah. is a long time ago. I know. In terms of like you giving over your source material, and they kind of ran with it in a way that maybe you didn't like, or are you was that a or no? It was one of those. Well, what happened was the. Um, that was a five years from when the book came out to it became a movie. And so pretty quickly after the book came out, they sent me a script that I thought was really needed um, a lot of work. And I wasn't even sure uh, they were following the book, like had they read the book. <laughs> right. Um, and I sent like a long, I think it was like nine or ten pages of notes. And then I became persona non grata. So I heard nothing for, for four years. And then um, uh, someone called me up, a friend of Matthew McConaughey's, who I knew, called me up and said, hey, Matthew just agreed to do this and wants to meet you. And so then I had a conversation with uh, McConaughey, and I said, I'd be happy to meet you, but I haven't seen a script in four years. I don't know what you've agreed to do. And so he, he emailed me the script, and it was by the same writer, and it was like edition 15. So this writer had stuck with it and, oh, and wrote a pretty good script. And I, I happened to be in Florida at that time, and I flew to Florida and read the script and met Matt, and I like just got off the plane thinking this could be a really good movie, and I can totally see McConaughey in it. Oh, he was great, yeah. You know, what what uh, did he – this was because this is this is ten this is twelve years ago. No. Yeah, it came out in twenty eleven. I think he had already done. Do you remember? Oh what, yeah, he was established. I, mean, yeah. I was wondering what what was his biggest movie just prior to this. Well, he it was interesting because he had gone through like he hadn't made a movie in two years, and he had made a bunch of rom coms before right, that, and right. be, and be kind of known as a rom com guy. And so when I met him, he said, I'm rebooting my career. I took two years off so people would forget about me. <laughs> and I have three or four uh, projects lined up. And one of them was like Dallas Buyers Club. He told me about right. it like two or three years before it came out. Right. So he had a really good plan. And this was one of them. And this was like the kind of the first serious one he had done in many years. Uh, the Lincoln the cast for that original Lincoln Lawyer movie was insane. Uh, Marissa Tomei, William H. Macy, John Leguizamo, Ryan Felipe, Brian Cranston. Like, wow. how many of those have <laughs> been signed when, by the, when you were talking to McConaughey? Uh, probably none of them. Really? Yeah. He, he, this was like early He's stages. He's a big fish, right? To yeah, remind everybody he, else. And then the director had, was like an independent film guy, and he had done a pretty good movie with Leguizamo as the star. And uh, a lot of people in Hollywood saw that movie and wanted to work with him, so that helped as well. Huh. So, okay. And um, Cranston, he, when they were filming it, because I went on set a couple times, only one season of Breaking Bad had come out. No kidding. And uh, it was funny. I had this. I was talking to him and telling him I really liked the show. Yeah, and and I said, it, it's funny how, how quickly it went like this. And I did my hand down. And he thought it was, I was saying, like, it, the show went bad. And I meant, I didn't go, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, right. I meant it just got dark so fast. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a dark. <laughs> and I remember his face thinking, like, you're <laughs> actually telling me you think the show went down. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. So, so the Lincoln Lawyer in particular, because I, I haven't read the book, uh, but I, I watched – I did my, my scant little research, and I was kind of cl flipping back and forth between the new show, the Netflix show, and then the old. I looked at both trailers, and uh, I was interested in that. Um, in the McConaughey movie, he's being chauffeured in, in in a town car, and then in the reboot as a series on Netflix, the lead is driving. He's shown driving. I think it's a '62 Continental. But then the navigator plays apparently a much larger role. First of all, is that a product placement at all? <laughs> no. Okay. And then what's the fascination? Like why Lincoln Lawyers? I understand it's his office, but where'd that sh where'd that shtick come from? Um, I met a guy at a Dodger game. Uh, it was the first uh, first game. You know, they're always afternoon, like April fourth. Um, so it was in two thousand and one. I went to the opening day of the Dodgers and sitting next to a guy who's wearing a tie. Because he's like playing, I, you know, on, these games are like one o'clock on a Tuesday, right? And you see a lot of people in ties because they just came over for an hour or something, right, right. playing hooky from downtown. So I started talking to him, and he said I was a lawyer, and you know, I had that stint in Van Nuys Courthouse when I was a reporter, 
and there's like at that time there was like 40 courthouses in LA County and uh, which I didn't know he told me um, but I did say to him where's your office you know because then I figured I might know some people that he knows and he says I work out of my car and that was how yeah. I was born and he and he said there's 40 courthouses in LA County 400 miles of freeways I have a big car. Um, I have a, a trunk that can hold three file cabinets, and uh, you know. And he told me the whole setup, and so I left that game knowing this is a story. Oh, I mean, this great. is a book. Wow. <laughs> and uh, was it, and he drove a Lincoln. So he drove. Is that was his? It wasn't no? a Lincoln. Okay. It was. Uh, um, it, but I went with Lincoln because of the. Uh, the it, uh, LL. Yeah. Alliteration. Uh, Alliteration. Consonants. But he is chauffeured in the in the books that I've read. He's he, yeah, he, he, and he, in he the show and he does. He he has that's his father's car, the old sixty two, and he drives ah, drives right, that right, every right. now and then. And they put it into the uh, what do you call it the trailer because it looks so cool. Right, right. You know? And I just need to tell everybody I'm very proud of myself because it's not shown fully. But I was able to. <laughs> wow, you I picked out the most iconic link. Listen, of all time. I, yeah, I was like, I think good that's job, a, editor of Motor. Train. I think that's a sixty-two, <laughs> and indeed, I'm correct. So, uh, pat, pat on my back. Well, speaking of that, since we're talking origins here, uh, Hieronymus Bosch is the character's actual name, not Harry Bosch. Like a. Uh, that's you know, nuts. Yeah, that's nuts. How'd you? How'd you? How'd that actually happen? And then B, where did Bosch come from? Well, there's a real life painter named Hieronymus. Bosch. I was just at the Prado looking at him. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so from the 15th century, and so I took a class when I was in college at the University of Florida, um, a humanities class, and the professor was stuck on Hieronymus Bosch. So we ended up studying his paintings and this guy for uh, like six weeks. Okay, and, wow. And, and That's and a lot of If you were at the Prado yeah. and you saw the Garden of Rosen Delights, it, saw it all, yeah. It, it stays with you. It's so then, super dark for those who don't know. Yeah. But also beautiful. I mean, they're, they're, they're like, the, you know, the, 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 that one, the triptych, like it starts out in, you know, Garden of Eden. It's pretty, it's, you know. It's, yeah. It, <laughs> and it goes like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, they're about the wages of sin. Right. You know, right. And the consequences. And, uh, you know, so... I read. I was well read in the mystery genre before I started writing a book, and I knew these things live and die with the character. I mean, right. you know, forensics and all that fancy stuff. That's window dressing on character. The, the reader has to connect with a character, and and so you should never miss a chance to say something, either you know subliminally or on right on the nose about someone's character, and that would include a name. So right. I, I wrote the first couple of drafts of the first book, calling him Pierce, because Chan Raymond Chandler had written a um, essay on writing crime fiction, and and he was talking about how a detective has to be able to pierce all levels of society, all veils, all this. He kept using the word Pierce, so I was calling him Pierce, and then I don't remember what jogged my memory about that class, but then I really. Real, I remembered Hieronymus Bosch, and I was writing about this guy. It didn't really turn out this way, but when I was first thinking about Harry Bosch or this character, I wanted him to be able to look at a crime scene like it's a painting and, and really kind of figure out what was going on. So I switched it to Bosch. Okay. I, I was interested. I always, my, you know, not knowing the interpretation was, and I, again, I'm familiar with, I'm a big fan of uh, Bosch the artist, but. He, you know, he yes, he does do the darkest of the dark, but his light is also really good. And I was, I always liked that about the character was that, you know, he's not, I don't know, your your typical LAPD person in that he, you know, he seems to have a lot of empathy for everybody, but also like really does want to, you know, punish the bad people. Also has this incredible dark side, which makes him, you know. Full figured and interesting. I'll just say, way to pay so, with a broad brush and ensure yourself that you'll get a ticket every time you're pulled over in, in the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> oh, I get a ticket every time I'm pulled over. Anyways, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's it, yeah, and, yeah. Unless they recognize me, a lot of a lot of the C H P likes me. It's the L A P D. They don't. You know, they also don't. L A P D doesn't pull you over. It's C H P pulls you over. Right. So, um, and then and then the 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 character like you know the, and again and it, it was interesting hearing Titus talk about it where he he interpreted it as this guy's an operator, this guy's special forces. And he's not a cop. He's not a normal cop. You know, that's, this is what Titus told me, was that, you know, I, I see him as, like, a special agent of the LAPD. Um, was that your intent? Uh, or is it more you were more private eye? Or, or how did you come up with the character? Um, no, I mean, that's 
what Titus has brought to it, um, the operator stuff, because he's fascinated by that. And yeah. And other roles he's had, he had to go through training and all that. Right. Um, I, w- the guy I wanted, um, I had worked on a construction job you know, for my dad, and I worked on a crew that was headed by a guy who had been a tunnel rat in Vietnam. Right. And uh, wouldn't really talk about it. But, but because I knew he did that, I did research on it. There was a book that came out in the 70s that about tunnel rats and pretty scary stuff. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, the, the uh, metaphor of tunnels and so forth, um, I wanted Bosch to be a tunnel rat. It was as simple as that. Um, yeah, it ties into the Bosch, the artist, like underground, dark, yeah. horrors. Yeah, and it's just, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's it's far away from being an operator. These guys went into tunnels with a forty five and a flashlight. You <laughs> right, know that was it. Right, right, right. You know, and uh, and and so it's not that kind of uh, character in the books. Right. And but you know when Titus is is at least a decade younger than the guy in the books, and he and he plays a little bit younger, even more. So yeah. So Bosch is military it would not be doing a draft period and things like that it would be some guy who he wanted, to do, wanted yeah. to do this right and uh and so that that lends to the operating uh, operator type stuff and and so forth so right was, yeah because i was i noticed that early when i was getting into the whole thing the whole world of it was like yeah there was a vietnam vet in the books and it was a gulf war vet in in the in the show and it was right. interesting i was like okay they shifted it 20 years yeah so. i mean it would be uh, it's funny that all comes down to a budgeting question to to even set a a show in 90s la would be very expensive sure just the line streets with cars and yep. things like that so it was a really quick decision. And early decision <laughs> we're gonna be <laughs> contemporary so therefore we need to rethink the guy can't be a vietnam vet or he'd be too old because we're hoping to get a good long run out of the show yeah you know if it had been a movie maybe you know, yeah because it's just two hours yeah Okay, we're, I think we're at the point where we need do need to get to cars, but I got one more question. One more, one more <laughs> question. Indulge yourself. And you're going to love it. Indulge, you're going to love it. You're going to love this one. The food. So I remember, because um, I think what happened with me was I watched like the, the first season and then I just bought every book and just was like, oh my God, yeah. But I remember the one that, re- I'm like, this guy really knows something. You, you mentioned Giamella's, you know. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, come on, that's like inside local and and uh, and I always see a, almost always see cops at GMLs, you know, picking up some hoagies or whatever when I'm there. And like, how did you really brought like, especially the show too, but like the the well, it's not especially the whole thing, like the food in LA is a character. The restaurants are a character. And yeah, like, was I mean, that what, you know, I, well, I mean, it's it's the reporter in me that you know why make that part out? You know, I you know, I Harry Bosch is not real, and but I want him to feel real and, and come across as real I and mean, i'm talking about in the books yeah and and so um, my idea was to take this made-up character's fictional character and really anchor his feet in a real landscape and so get all that stuff right and have him go to real restaurants and things like that you know you guys are from la and and that might mean something to you but most of the people who read these books have never even been to la sure so it's really something to do with the writing process that uh, that helps okay. me Got write, it. write these books because i was gonna say why bother with restaurants you could do you know whatever but right that, that's but you know it's it's just the reporter in me like i know where cops would go and so forth. right they tell me or i'd interview them there and and so forth so so i i just like using real places um, I I would only make up a place if if I'm gonna like murder somebody. In sure, it, you know, and because um, they might not like that idea. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> so I what? I had a one of my books called Angels Flight. Oh, yeah. I had two people killed on Angels Flight, and you know I thought that was like public transportation. I didn't know it was privately owned Oops. and all the stuff, and I never got any permission. And one day I'm doing a signing and um, and I'm, my head's down I'm signing books and someone puts a business card there and it says oh, no. executive director of Angel. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, I'm in trouble here. But he was he was actually he was happy. Right. But he did kind of let me know I should have sought permission anyway. Oh, that was a good book. That was yeah. a good season and a good book. That was no. that was. That Wait, was you have awesome. to as a as a writer of fiction, you need to like let at least let him know. Well. 
No, I technically no, but to to keep good graces and so forth, you know, it it did come around because we ended up like they, they more f- than ten years, almost twenty years later, filming there. Yeah, and that guy, uh, you know, uh, greased the skids for us to film there. Interesting. So, yeah. So yeah. can can you uh, indulge me a second then and call out some of the uh, the favored restaurants for oh, Luso and Frank's for, for officers like real like. <laughs> oh. uh, for, from, from your research. For detectives. For, for most of them from, are... Um, are they still around? Yeah, no. I mean, but most of them are like taco trucks and stuff. But um, a big one for Hollywood Division is Birds on Franklin. Okay. Um, because they get a discount there. <laughs> and so... Um, and it's, it's, that's a good, really good food there. And usually when I'm in there, um, I see cops in there. I've gone in there to interview cops... Uh, and so forth. So I, you know, and they pick the place. So that that's a big one. Um, a lot of the places uh, along in Silver Lake, uh, just going down Sunset and so forth. That that seems to be a, a big place. Um, the one that never reopened after uh, uh, COVID is Pacific Dining Car, which yeah. is across the street yeah. from yeah, Rampart. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Good scene with uh, with Chief Irvin in in, uh, in Pacific Dining Car. Yeah, I'm glad we filmed in there a couple times before it went away. Um, and before we get to the cars, <laughs> this is this is a, this is a funny. This is a, this is. A, I do want to talk about cars. This is an awkward, delicate question. Not uh-oh, really. Oh. Well, no, well, the subject matter, because you're in talking to you about where you were doing your your coverage for the L.A. Times. You're North Los Angeles. You're you're in the Valley. Valley Bureau, also known as Porn Valley, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and you were there in an interesting time for that scene as well. Like, how much of the the crime you were reporting was drugs, gangs, or this other like rising business, which is also like always talked about. It's like the dark underbelly of yeah, it's a of bi- Hollywood billion billion dollar. Industry. Well, it's because yeah, yeah. you know a lot of people travel from all over the world, all over the country, to come to LA to make it as a star, and if they fall just a little bit short. They end up well in the valley. Plus, a lot of, you know, equipment rental is equipment rental. You know, <laughs> I mean, wow. yeah, that was part of the beat. Um, you know, so the way it worked was there was a day cops and a night cops guy, and I was mostly night cops. Um, but we would work long term projects, and we did a lot of stuff on uh, on the porn industry um, because you know it has billions of dollars and it's all based there. There's a couple of interesting murders of people um, that were involved in that business that um, I wrote a lot of stories about. I was gonna, well, also you wrote a book. I mean, there was um, um, I'm forgetting the title of it, but there was uh, there was an old porn tape that right was a was it wasn't that. Like, I've written thirty-seven books. So I don't remember okay. them all. Yeah, so, yeah. There's, um, there's but, one. But I put it this way: I wrote porn about stars it. murdered. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was a concrete blonde. Concrete blonde. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, if yeah. I wrote about it as a reporter, I definitely probably wrote about it as a novelist because I because <laughs> I had that you know right that knowledge or that information. Mm. Right, right, right. All right. All right. So um, <clears throat> now that we're over an hour in, let's <laughs> let's uh, let's let's talk about let's talk about cars. Look, uh, how much to the extent because we talked about L.A. as a character, L.A. food as a character, L.A. PD as a character. L.A. is also known for cars. Oh yeah, yeah. Johnny, I'm gonna ask you how yeah. much of how much of that element ends up in in the books and the well. I thought the, the show I thought was shows. funny. No matter where they are, I, 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 I'm sure this is intentional, but no matter where they are in LA, it's like be there in 30 minutes, which I thought was great because it's like you know, very LA thing. But it, it that I assume that was intentional. Yeah, and the one thing we did uh, was make it um, real. In other words, uh, you know, most shows like. The guy in Hollywood has to go to Santa Monica, and he's there. You know, the next scene he's there. Yeah, we we never uh, fake that stuff. It, right, we, we take the real roots and so forth. And it's interesting the uh, the opening where I already talked about with Vince Scully and all that. The track they follow this guy he's a suspected serial killer, and and they follow him out of Echo Park through downtown and into Boyle Heights, and the the route is actually real what they yeah. do. They, yeah they, I, he I, jumps on the metro and all this kind of stuff it's exactly the the route and right like, no one does that you know why do that and who's going to care or who's going to know but but i know and, yeah and, and I, we just felt we wanted to do it that i way. mean the famous one i always thought was was a pretty woman you know where you know uh, richard gear lands at lax and then trying to get to beverly hills winds up a burrito king in echo park which is like 
absolutely the most ridiculous right. thing. And then two, and then, and then like it's like where's where's Beverly Hills? <laughs> it's there, and like you know he's there right. a second later. And it's right, just right. it's like come on, you know, like what is this? So, um, but um, but as for you, I mean, I've been told uh, from from when I started talking with Bosch people, which is uh, mostly uh, my friend Mark Douglas, I'm sure, he's a friend of yours. Um, but he was like, yeah, you got to get you got to get Michael on the show because he's a big car guy. He's got these Porsches. Uh, he's into Porsches, and then I hear you're doing some sort of EV conversion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I qualify as a car guy, but I, I am very lucky in that. That's probably my indulgence that I change cars a lot. I don't ever have a lot of cars, but I also have a homestead in uh, in Florida, so I have a place in Florida. I have a car there, and you know. So anyway, I um, this is probably a sacrilege, so I apologize. To no, all, no, all, all the no, Porsche. We're, we're about sacrilege here. Okay, it's inevitable. <laughs> On the inevitable. All right, so I I, I have a '65. Uh, 356 coupe oh, and, I'm nice. on, and I'm on a waiting list that uh, you guys know about Z Electric in yes. San Diego Yep. that I want to make it an electric car okay why do you want to make it an electric car because I I really like electric cars I always seem to have um, I go there's probably an electric car other than yours um, that I haven't had yet like so I've had Tesla Jaguar BMW Taycan right I have a you had a Leaf uh, no, but I, I did have the yeah, Bolt? Uh, the original um, EV1. No, the, what's the one that BMW had that only goes? 60 oh, i3, i3, and i3. Okay, I now have their iX. Oh, um, what do you think of the iX? Oh, I saw that. I, I saw you parking. That's what. That's who, yeah. You were you, you parked on the curb. Yeah. IX. What do you, What do you think of the iX? I like it. Yeah, I've it's only good. had I, it um, about four months. I think phenomenal interior. Yeah, it's, re- it's really good. I mean the. So you're okay. I don't know if you guys have sponsors. You can say no. bad stuff or good. Yeah, stuff. we can say bad stuff. It was it was interesting. I n- I didn't like the Tesla. Um, I'm an old guy. I'm 66. So the Taycan is a beautiful car, but I didn't like getting stooping down to get uh-huh. into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gave me back problems. Um, <laughs> uh, so I really do like the the iX, but but I really loved and the the one only one I regret giving up was um the jaguar oh yeah i just thought that was a really good car yeah i pace yeah. that was a good I and mean, that thing was just cursed by not having competitive range but yeah i mean i had one it was it was we're gonna it unpack was fast this. we're gonna unpack this in detail okay but it was fast nice car yeah it just it just the battery just wasn't there but you know now it's coming back as a fisker that, that platform is the new Fisker Ocean. Oh, really? Yeah, and, it'll ha- and it's going to have much more power, more bigger battery. So, but you're saying that you know they the it will say you have 200 miles and you get on the freeway and it turns out you have 80 that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. and it, it will also it was it was only rated at like 220 when like a Tesla Model X, which was you know price wise was a competitor, was getting like 350. You right. know what I mean? So it's a big well, discrepancy. I w- but I want to hear from you, where, uh, Michael, where. Um First of all, where are you driving? Are these in LA? Are these in both in Florida? Like, where where is the bulk of your EV driving done? And then what is it? Is it like daily commute? Or are you actually like driving long distances? Or what's what's the use? It's a little bit of both. Um, in Florida, I don't have an electric car. I have a Defender. Okay. Um, he, here. What um, year Defender? New one or old one? Uh, Paint a picture. New one. I just got it. Oh, nice. um, After waiting a year. SUV. F- Motor former Trends, former SUV, SUV of the, of the year, year from two years ago. Yeah, yeah. We like the Defender. Was, what you know. The uh, what do you call it? The supply backup. Yeah, supply, supply chain, chain non. Yeah. yeah, it turns out the whole world was held together by one piece of string, and then <laughs> yeah, and the chips. And so I just got this brand new um, two weeks ago, and they can only give me one key. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. super uh, sadly two, uh, common. Two door or four door? Four door. That's that's real common in the industry. Next next time you want to call me, I can. I, I got a friend who's a celebrity. I got her the first defender in the U.S. So. Oh really? Oh yeah. So uh, let me know. Okay, so Florida, wisely, given the weather situation, you have a super capable <laughs> off-road vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That actually played into it because uh, my place is on the uh, on the beach in the uh, barrier island called Siesta Key. Okay. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, which yeah. just narrowly escaped a couple weeks ago. Okay. Um, if you do get a Rivian, you know, they can actually drive underwater forever. So Really? Yeah, it's electric. It, it's sealed. So it's well, forever yeah. might be we well we'd not, have to test that yeah yeah but no there's a great video of a guy launching a boat and instead of backing the boat down the ramp he just drives into the lake with the Rivian waters, on purpose for once yeah water waters up to about the windows and they get they just float the boat off and then he drives out 
Hmm. So, you know, you can do that. Okay. <laughs> that, so that, that sounds like a vehicle for Florida, right? Uh, yeah, it's you know, it's it's uh, you gotta have uh, yeah, it's 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 a great truck. We can talk about that, but anyways, yeah, back to that. Well, so what are you you so in LA, LA you have you have all your you've had all your EVs. Yeah. Okay. So i three i pace uh, which Tesla was it? Uh, the ninety, I think. So, so the it's the, the S, model the S sedan, 90. not the yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, nice car. And what year did you? Are we early adopter on that one or? Was that, yeah, it was a long time ago. Twenty, so it would be it wouldn't be any earlier than twenty thirteen. So we're talking like twenty, yeah, twenty fourteen, twenty fifteen. Yeah, you didn't. So you liked it, but you didn't like you. You didn't like it. I liked it okay. Um, I just I think I wanted more. I also had problems with it, like they had to replace everything once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was that was the the initial problem with Tesla was like the battery, the motor, and then the the control arms all had to be replaced. Yeah, and, luckily uh, when it. You know, had this meltdown or whatever it was. It right. was in my garage, so oh, it wasn't marooned somewhere. Right, right, right. But um, Are you, so <clears throat> you're 66. You've been so you've been driving EVs for almost 10 years now. Are you? Um, how? How? What's your view on the tech? Are you like I? I love it. I'm into it. It's too much. Like lots of screens. Like I guess what, I like all that stuff. You do. I, I don't know why. I guess I'm. Besides being a car guy, I'm a gadget guy. I guess um, I I like it. Um, th- it's interesting how so, so many of them are the same, but, but then they also have their little differences and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, so I'm I don't know. I you know my wife has never driven any of my cars because of that stuff. She doesn't. She gets like freaked out by like it's like you're in a plane or something, a pi- a cockpit of a plane or something. Oh, yeah, too many choices. Type thing. Um, yeah. Charging. You charge at home mostly. Yeah. yeah okay. Totally. So then, right. The question I was gonna ask then, if you didn't, was, you know, going from Tesla, which has its own supercharger network, it's a huge advantage. It's it's a it's it unless, is unless you only charge from home, that doesn't make any difference. Right. Which yeah. I guess is what what I'm asking because because it is emerging as other manufacturers enter the space that supercharging, having your own cu- bespoke custom you know charging network with its own handle and the app is is, is quite seamless is is cons- considered by some to be a huge advantage but what's been your what was the what was the experience like switching from tesla to a, to now the you know a jaguar and a bmw i guess it's irrelevant right because you you're just running a charger at home yeah yeah i mean i just answered the question i think i <laughs> the uh trying to remember I, I just don't remember any kind of transition that as being an issue. and there there wouldn't be right i mean if you charge at home you charge it, it's like you know you plug in your vacuum cleaner it's just the same thing yeah i mean i didn't i don't have i mean i'm very lucky and you know we're here in la the you know the capital of bad traffic but i i work at home i'm i'm a writer you know so in more recent years i've had to go out a lot more because of tv shows and so forth and so I'll go to sets and stuff like that, but I but I'm not putting a lot of miles on my cars, and so I don't even need a supercharger because there might be days where I don't even use my car. Sure. You know, so um, you know. But then so you I had a, you, you had like uh, like a Cayman or a couple Caymans or something like that. I've had um, I, no, I never had a Cayman. That's probably the only model I've never had. Okay, but you had like nine elevens and Boxsters and yeah, okay. Yeah. Cayennes and, and, and my I've had Cayennes and my wife has a Macan. I have a I had a Panamera. I had one of the first ones. So you have a you like Porsche as a, as a yeah. Brand. I've just always liked them, the, their yeah. looks and so forth. This this old one I got is the first old one I ever had. Yeah, it's it's funny because I have I have a nine fourteen, which is uh, slowly being rebuilt in nineteen seventy. But all my friends are like, yeah, as soon as you've spent like you know fifty thousand dollars on it, you can have a car with eighty horsepower. You know, so that's the EV swap in a three five six does make a lot well, of sense. Well, let's talk about that. So, are you swapping a perfectly good running three five six? Is that what's well? Going it on? does. It's it's severely underpowered. That's <laughs> that's one reason. One is I'm I just become an electric guy, and I studied uh, Z electric and looked at some of their cars and stuff. And it, to me, it's kind of an exciting thing, and it will make that car faster. Okay. And you keep the old engine, right? I mean, the old engine doesn't get like you know thrown in a dumpster. Like if you if you want to sell it, you can. Here's the old engine, four bolts. It's a it's a Volkswagen. 
goes back in. I never even thought about keeping it, but now maybe I will. Yeah, just for resale. Yeah, it, yeah. it's the simplest thing. I've, I've, I know I'm familiar with like, because Z Electric does do 911s and, and 356s and bugs. And, you know, it's a Volkswagen motor, four bolts, whole thing slides out. You just keep it on the shelf. You go to sell it. You can sell it as an EV. Here's the engine, or throw the EV stuff away. Put the engine back. I might, I might have a guy for you if you don't want to wait. My buddy in Austin, Moment Motors, is also doing this vintage. Oh, yeah. This vintage electric transition is is happening in, in a, def, a bunch of different spots, and he's he's been one of the uh, leaders. Moment Motors. Motors. Moment. Mark Davis at Moment. Oh so, yeah, yeah, I know Mark. I'll yeah. look that up. Yeah, I'll shoot you. Yeah, yeah, because that's the thing. Uh, it is so underpowered compared to you know contemporary vehicles that I don't really care to drive it that much. Right. So, so you so oh so you've already you've you've had this car for a while. You didn't buy it expressly to do this this swap. You, no, you, I did. Oh, you did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me. Uh, this is a question I like to ask uh, all the super successful famous people we have. <laughs> uh, that's true. When, um, when okay, so you were you were uh, crime beat reporter. You did. You tried two attempts at a novel. Your third one is successful. You leave. You leave the LA Times in '94. You're a full-time novelist. I don't know when you made it big or what the big, the big one was. But what was the splurge? What was like that? Ah, yes. I've made it. So now I'm gonna buy a Patek Philippe <laughs> or a car. Let's see, like, what's what, a car? Yeah. What was it? It was a Boxster. Okay. Oh, so it was a Porsche. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it was funny. It was their, what, what was the first year of the Boxster? Oh, like, you would ask something. that. Yeah. Oh, you would. Why would you ask that? I look like a fool, but like, yeah, ninety seven, six, seven. Yeah, ninety eight. That's about 99. when I felt like I could probably afford something like that. Nice. Okay. And um, there's another writer in town, um, and he's a car guy. You should get him on. Named Robert Crace. I don't know. If oh yeah, but yeah, yeah. A very good writer. Okay. And we used to meet for lunch about once a month, and. Uh, and those those early um, boxers mostly came in the, the what do you call it silver right yeah. right yeah. with the maroon the the dark red interior right or and the black top and um, so we're I'm meeting Bob Trace for lunch and um, um, he's in the Valley on Ventura Boulevard so I I drive in, in my brand new boxer I just picked up. And park at a meter, and then another duplicate pulls in <laughs> front of me and parks at a meter, and he gets out. Uh, <laughs> so we, then you got to trade it in, right? We were just we just started laughing. That's great, but hey, I mean, you made it as writers, which is yeah. like you know we're we're, we're writers, you know, uh, uh, you know, we just write for a car magazine, but like to be able to earn a living writing words is ridiculous, you know. Um, you, yeah, it's a long shot. <laughs> yeah, that's why it goes back to my father's idea was a pretty good one. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then so um, it, it sounds so – you've had a lot of cars, it sounds like. You said you've gone through – you've been lucky the you know, to go catalog, through, yeah. through many. <laughs> um, two questions. One is what's one – what's the one that got away when you kind of bummed you got rid of? And then tell me about the EV transition because that's actually happening right around the time you you scored and you're you're doing boxsters like you know GM's got an EV one out Toyota comes out the Rav four electric. Oh, right? those are such small numbers. I know, but then subsequently you get a. But the Tesla was the that sure, was the damn which burst. is like which yeah. is ten years ten years yeah. later. But yeah. so so any vehicles that you wish you hadn't sold or gotten rid of, and then what's the what was this, the transition like? What got you into that? I assume it was the Tesla first. It could have been the i. No, it was the i3 was the first three? one I got. Okay. And um, and that didn't work because of uh, – it would have worked for me just being a novelist because of the amount of driving. But then I got my show, and we were filming all over L.A., and it just – Small wouldn't. rain. Yeah. So w- let me ask you this, because it, 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 what attracted you to the i3? Um, I just – I don't know. Maybe it's me – worried about climate and things like that i just thought right i'm gonna try this and then you know once you try it and you realize these cars go faster than anything yeah. else <laughs> right 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 it's like never mind the climate i just like the performance so um i mean i'm, I'm kind of in that boat like that's that's why i went after the rivian was i'm like wait you can get this much horsepower for like that little money like you're very you know, soft spoken, but you're like a speed freak you're like really into acceleration I, well i so <laughs> not necessarily going super fast but i i also live on mulholland drive which is a winding road and okay. i and i want to have a car that you know that's what i'm really interested in 
the um, transition with the the three fifty six. That that's gonna okay. be fun mm-hmm. to oh, drive on great. that road. And driving that now as it is, and and you know the shift is all over the place and all that. And so. <laughs> well, but okay, but then again, still holding out for your the one that got away. But um, well, you you didn't ask it. Yes, the, the, the transition question. I know. What's the, what's the car electric gas powered whatever that got away? That you're like, oh man, I wish I hadn't gotten rid of that one. Or is there one? Well, I had um, when I was in high school, I I um, made money by buying Volkswagens, fixing them up and selling them and hmm. i did that multiple times in high school so probably my first one which i okay. i sold i wish i still had um and i've looked into uh you know buying one uh, same same which same, which was what just a 68 uh okay. i was gonna say deal. 67 but yeah, 60, yeah. Okay. okay and um but i also um had a uh a Triumph TR4A, 1968. Oh, nice! That just had a great paint job. And what, um, what color? It was yellow. Yellow. And it had a. They did this weird thing where they did uh, the, the stripe, the racing stripe across the hood. Yes. Not, not like going this way. Right. And I loved that car, the way it looked, and and uh, I had that when I was in Florida. So when I moved, uh, pretty much became full time LA. I got rid of it i should have just kept it or stored i mean that's a that's a gettable car that's not yeah that's not you know my my dad had a boy he had a white tr4 and then he had a a yellow tr6 and he loved the six it was just like crazy about i had a maroon tr6 okay so boxer tr you like your convertible guy then florida guy except this coupe um i just love the way the coupes look gorgeous design yeah yeah, like it's a piece of art or yeah but then the question for me is is the guy who likes performance cars they like you like the acceleration you like the twisties are you not missing and this is a common uh criticism of evs the sound yeah no i'm not really no I, it's funny i don't like loud cars i mean i, yeah. I don't know i want to be respective of neighbors or whatever i don't like i'm also a morning person so i often leave the house early to uh, get coffee or, or breakfast or something i don't want to wake up people in the house so, I'm gonna so i've like, never had loud cars don't buy don't buy a cadillac uh escalade v oh yeah that's that's the hot tip that's a super loud car <laughs> no, if, you, I, well, if you like your neighbors it's, it's don't funny, buy one. when they announce like so and so is going electric or whatever. So like I ordered a Mustang and then I just didn't take it. I didn't like it mm-hmm. when it came. I have I'm on the new Cadillac. I'm on that list. The lyric. Yeah. Mm. And um, see see what that's like when I when it comes. Delayed. That's like delayed at the yeah. moment. Super. They, I think it's like fascinating. Fascinating car because we had we had your BMW iX. We had the Cadillac Lyric. We had the Nissan Aria. Hyundai Ionic uh, Five, five Kia, Kia EV6. Yeah. Um, oh boy, I'm missing. A, I'm missing like five other. It we was had the stacked. Rivian. We uh, had all the of these Rivian vehicles SUV, yeah. at our SUV of the year, and just drove them back to back to back to back to back. And it was very much. I tell people it was like uh, it's this moment where um, uh, we're ten years. We're literally ten years after Elon uh, and Tesla dropped the Model S. It was our twenty. 13 car of the year so we, we drove did this. in 12 we yeah. did this in the summer of 2012 where we do our big program we test all the vehicles we're 10 years past that and it's like okay pencils down turn in your homework what do you got bmw <laughs> oh you got an ix what do you got hyundai oh you got an ix5 and it's everybody's answer is it's like the same but different it's everyone's putting mm-hmm. batteries in the floor they got motors near the wheels but then the experience itself is wildly different depending on their approach to certain aspects of the technology um I think you've had you've driven some you had some excellent uh, cars that you've driven in your stable. I am very curious what you're going to think about that, about the lyric. Um, but well, also the IX is like such a just such a it, they did a good job. You know what I mean? Like except it's, for the it's, exterior, maybe. Well, I, I don't. Do you, like, do you it, like the way it looks on the outside? People are very very the, the grill kind of drives people nuts. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of it. But the interior, I think, is and yeah. I think what you were saying about. Very, very valid about Taycan, sports car, low seating position. And you, what you didn't actually say is BMW, when you get in, it's like sitting on a, an easy chair. Like right. the, the hip point is, is quite high. And the seat itself is fully covered, which is really – it's a 
if you should, right now, if you're at, in front of a computer, you should Google BMW iX interior. It's like all leather swath and with uh, like with like nice bits. nice wood. Like t- it's actually yeah. the, the the buttons are in the wood, which is like a pretty pretty, pretty cool wild. thing. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, I like being in it. The uh, I like the way some of the uh, the other BMWs look better than this. But. Right. Yeah. I, do you find? And this is something I wanted to talk about with our guests who are EV EV savvy in particular. Because I think I think this is what you're getting at. You're a, you want to be respectful of your neighbors. You're a morning person. You're relative to Johnny, soft spoken. Um, are is it? Do um, you find the meditative environments more so than internal combustion powered vehicles? Like I always, I think about this now because I'm spending a lot of time in EV. I just drove back from our truck of the year program in an electric pickup truck, and it was you know 400 miles from Arizona in a in a car that doesn't make any noise. So I'm just like I'm alone with my thoughts. You know? <laughs> it's, which I is, think there is that aspect. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's funny you know with the IX. I, I went on the launch of it, and uh, we were in Bavaria, and um, you know I was on the autobahn, so I took it up to like 125 miles an hour and set the cruise control. And I just wanted to like met, like see what kind of range you'd get at that speed, and it was like it's like being in a jet just because like you know it's pretty fast, and yet silent and pleasant. And I was like, wow, this is I've never experienced this before. It's a new experience, and it was like it was very cool. So, um, we're getting a bit of a high sign here, so we're going to wrap up here. But oh. I do want to ask, um, bring it back to the work that you do. You know, again, LA story. You get you write a lot of LA stories. Um, LA is a character, the police and all that. Cars is a. Will will we see an electric vehicle? <laughs> will will there? Are you able to write that in, or do you have some bar for like when? This is a big shift going on in the automotive business, where it actually like pierces the public consciousness right oh that'll make sense like this character can drive this vehicle or or la is like the king of of teslas right now everywhere you go it's a model three or a model y boss drives a xj uh uh, cherokee by the way so okay yeah like is there is there are you just like well it's perception adoption all this stuff is going to lag a little bit so probably not no i mean i'll say two things one thing about bosch's car was very much um, thought about and you know it's a square car and he's like the square peg in a round hole so we wanted his car to be emblematic of him plus it's pretty old um but th- in the new show uh, he has a guy who does all his it stuff because he's still kind of uh anachronistic about all right. that stuff um but that guy has an electric car right that's right that's right and, yeah uh, and uh so you know that character would be of this wave, I think. And so okay. we gave him an electric. So I got, I got a way to, I got a way to end this. I think you might find this interesting. So currently at the Peterson Museum, a friend of ours, Magnus Walker, massive Porsche collector, and he's got a, he's got an exhibit. Yeah, I know who he is. Okay, yeah. you know he lived in the house that that Bosch in the show. He lived in that house. Oh, for, he did. Yeah, isn't that wild? Like, uh, what, I forget the name of the house, but uh, it's it's where Bosch lives in the show. Um, I don't know if it has a name. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great, you know, stilty glass house Not overlooking uh, L.A. Mul- it's, it's off Mulholland. It's, uh, yeah, it's on, I think, Blue Heights or something like and that. And so I was just was driving around with Magnus one day, and he's like, you know, Bosch, I think I was, I'm like, hey, I'm interviewing Titus tomorrow, something like that. And he's like, oh, you know, I lived in that, in his English accent, I lived in that house for like 16 months. I was like, how did that happen? He's like, I just, I saw it, I thought it was so cool. I just kept bugging the landlord, and finally he said, "Fine, you can move in for three months." And then he kept extending the lease three months, and then finally gave him the boot. Huh. But just to tie that Porsches was, and that Bosch. That was and, in um, the house that was in Heat. Yeah, that Robert De Niro lived in. Right. That movie. Right, right, right. Oh. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the, the producer of that movie is a producer on Bosch, and he has these Rolodexes from sure. forty years of making movies, and he just called the guy up and said you want to rent it again so. right that's awesome yeah cool. so cool house. 356 gets converted to uh we should talk a little bit about this before we, we oh call okay it. yeah yeah what um what's the powertrain and range what do you what do you think you're going to get out of uh, z electric with this, this it won't have a big range but i don't i don't think i really need it it's not going to be my main car um so th- i think and again, I'm on a waiting list, so I haven't gotten into any kind of tech with him them at all. Um, but on their website, they they're saying like 200. Okay. Um, oh, and 200 is totally usable. Yeah. Are they yeah. using? I'm not super familiar. Are they using Tesla batteries and, yeah. and motors? Okay. Yeah. So that'll yeah. that's a that's a known quantity in terms of doing these conversions. Right. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. 
I, I, I thought the range would be half of that. That's pretty good if it's 200. So. And then do you go to these um, cars and coffee things that he goes to? Ever been out to the <laughs> – do you, do you go on, on Sundays or weekends or you kind of like uh, enjoy it? No. Your, yeah. Busy writing. No, I just stay at home and watch the Motor Trend <laughs> channel. Oh, <laughs> sure. Thank you. Do thank you. That. On that note, on that <laughs> note no, I, I do watch. That? I watch those. Uh, you know, that's what I did in high school. I mean, to a right. much lesser degree. Like, sure. Than those guys who are restoring things and stuff. I love those shows. Oh, cool. Oh, it's so like hear. chasing classic car, like Wayne Carini, like like. Yeah. Oh, huh? okay. Okay. All right. You yeah. That makes sense. Oh. That tracks. Okay. Well. Good to hear. Yeah. Uh, we new book. Get... Wait, wait, wait. New book. Uh, uh, even though this, we don't know when this podcast is going to come out, but this book comes out November s- ninth. I think ninth. Eight, eight, something like so that. Desert Stars, the new. We didn't even talk about her, but it's the new uh, Renee Ballard, uh, Harry Bosch book, and I'm loving Ballard. By the way, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe that's it. Um, does Ballard ever get uh, onto a TV show? Is this is this being? T- I mean, obviously. Yeah, I hope so. Um... Where, where, what do you call it? What's the Hollywood word? It's in development. In development. Yeah, we'll okay. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, cause she's she's amazing. So, Ed, and for people listening, you know, Bosch in the series now is in the 70s, right? I mean, 70, in, in, yeah, he's born in 1950. Yeah, so he's in the books. He's, he's old, bad knee. Um, so, like, the, the heavy action is kind of this woman, Renee Ballard, who's a, a homo- now she's a homicide detective. Right. Re- restarting the, the cold case unit or yes. something. So I'm excited about that because... Do you want to? I feel like you want to ask him one more question. But while you think about it, yeah, I'm gonna. Ask, I'm gonna. Ten thousand. I know. Questions. Cause, cause, well, yeah, I'm yeah, gonna yeah. ask him my own. Because you've been yeah. indulging yourself this whole time. So well, think, I, of, think, and think of one more. No, I'm good. I'm good. I, I, I will ask him one I'm, indulgent. I'm promoting his new book. I, I'm gonna start. <laughs> I'm a. I'm a. I like science fiction. The only fiction I read is science fiction, and I'm a nonfiction guy. So I loved. Uh, but I want to ask you. Who I should be reading because I do like this. I do like the the true crime genre. You should read Michael Connolly. I'm gonna. I am. I'm gonna. But I'm gonna start at the beginning. So I will start. I will definitely start with your first book. Yeah. Um, but tell me. Oh, I'll give you a recommendation. Uh, an LA book. Okay. It's uh, called Your House Will Pay by Steph Cha C H A. Okay. Check that out. It's a pretty good book. It's like maybe yeah, awesome. four years old. Okay. Three years Done. Maybe. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. I was also going to ask you why it, uh, why the best true crime, I don't even know it's true crime, novel isn't uh, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. Ooh. True or false? It's, what are you saying? Is it the best? Yes. Are you saying it's fiction? No. Oh, okay. Best true, isn't it? No, a, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an important and great book, yeah. What yeah. about what I read about it a couple times? What it is, I, it is it's, it's one of my great. favorites, just it's from the language book. perspective. Yeah. What and then what about um, uh, Elroy? Yeah, what about <laughs> I've, uh, yeah? I've read lots of his stuff. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I like Elroy. Um, Black well, Dahlia, Wild, just because it's so Black Dahlia's good, but you got you got to read like like the American Quartet or the new the new books are just like off the hook. Like it's it's I only the, read the old stuff. Yeah. Okay, but I will I will start with Chuck. Well, let me ask it. How is the next season end with this? How's the new season of uh, of Boss shaping up? Boss Legacy, I should say. I'm um, really good. I think it's going to be our best season. Yeah. Um, and we're more than halfway through. We're filming. Right now, episode seven of ten, so we're almost done. I break my. I've been trying to get down to the set, but you know, just COVID restrictions, I, I can't get on because Mark's been promising me for like since season Mark six. Mark will get you on. Uh, he's uh, I, like I said, he was he, he's trying, but COVID is is a, and I and and I I've done some stuff where COVID's been a real, uh, a problem getting the you know the cameras to roll. So I, I'm I'm cool with it. But. Yeah, I mean, most of the. Uh... The agreements, like with the Screen Actors Guild, is like no visitors. But if you, they have a um, protocol where if they they test you one day, you can come the next day. Yeah, you know, aren't you trying to get on and be? A, yes, I, I want to be a corpse, or you know, uh, you know Can just, you get? <laughs> can you get? Sad, can you get your SAG card being a corpse? I don't no. care about my SAG card. I just want. I mean, Titus, both Titus and Mark were like, yeah, we'll 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 make you like you know, we'll you, you just be a dead body or something, you know. I don't know if the world needs to see that because that probably means you can be naked under a sheet or something. Whatever, man. Whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. On that note, <laughs> on that, with that happy visual, uh, thank you, Michael, yeah. Mike, Connolly. I, we'd love to have you in after the conversion happens, and let's talk yeah. about your next your next TVs. And if you ever want to come out and drive uh, some cars, we're any going. anything. Let me. Yeah. We're by yeah, yeah. the LA Times new headquarters. We're in El oh, Segundo, okay. so just give yeah. us a shout, and we got stuff all the time. All right, and right. I'm up near Glendale, so uh, you know. So, yeah, we got all kinds of good stuff. Cool.
Yeah. Thank, well, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you.